<laughs> All right. Well, it looks like every. It? I'm sorry. What, Cole? I was just saying, do you want me to switch over the PowerPoints then? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Why don't we go ahead and, and switch okay. over? Yeah, I'm not always good at communicating those pieces, so um, that would be awesome. And we'll just go ahead and get rolling. So I think. Um, it looks like most everyone's on mute, so thank you for that. Um, and then if we do have bandwidth concerns, um, we can shut off our cameras, but we're a small group. So um, if you wanna keep them on for now and just see how it goes, I think that's great. And we'll, um, we'll mention it if it seems like things are, are getting a little herky-jerky. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to start today with, our, um, with just welcoming everyone and um, doing our, our land acknowledgement. And so I'm going to launch into that and then we'll move into our program. So we collectively acknowledge, acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Duluth is located on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on land that was cared for and called home by the Ojibwe people before them, Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people and other native peoples from time immemorial. Seated by the Ojibwe in an 1854 treaty, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, the native nations and peoples of this region. We recognize and continually support and advocate for the sovereignty of the native nations in this territory and beyond. By offering this land acknowledge, we affirm tribal sovereignty and will work to hold the University of Minnesota Duluth accountable to American Indian peoples and nations. And so with that, um, I think I would just like to turn it over to um, Cole or open it up to Anne if there are pieces that I missed. And we've got a couple of um, fun questions for you to, to uh, contemplate. So um, for an icebreaker today, we would like you to navigate to this um, email address that we had on the screen. We'll drop it here in the chat. And then um, we just have a couple questions to kind of help get things rolling. I'm going to activate the poll here. Oh, too many windows, too many windows. <clears throat> Let's see it. All right, so I'm going to put this up on the screen then. And what we'd just like you to do is think about what would you do if you were a phytoplankton and where would you rather live? Um, you can just click on your screen to indicate which option you prefer. And hopefully here we should see everybody's answers popping in. Ah, there we go. I'm starting to see some. Okay. It's kind of a small group, but I think we have a few more people who should be Jumping on board here. Oh, it looks like everybody wants to be Zen. <laughs> okay, let's give it just a couple more seconds. I think one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine. I think that might be everybody. All right, so living in a fresh, crystal clear uh, lake appears to appeal to most people if they were phytoplankton. Um, so let's take a little bit of a turn towards something slightly more serious and put ourselves into the mindset for today's activity. Um, hopefully you should be able to answer this question before. Um, I'm sorry, answer this question about whether or not you've used one of these devices before. We're gonna talk about some of these later in our presentation. Okay, get some answers rolling in here. Give everybody a few more seconds. Oh, 
Oh, a few people have used them all. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and bounce back to our presentation. It looks like hopefully everybody's had a chance to answer and quite a few people have used at least one or more. So that's good news. If you haven't heard of these before, not to be worried, we will talk about several of these later in our presentation. Um, I'm going to jump back over to our PowerPoint now. And what we'd like for you to do is to just take a moment and let us know for those of you who have used some of these devices in um, just a few words, what ways you've used them or why you've used them in your work. And this will just kind of help us get an idea of uh, what people are up to. So if you just go ahead and share those ideas in the chat, so we'll give you a couple minutes, see what we can uh, get going on in the chat. Okay. Okay, we had a few new people jump on. Welcome. Okay, a lot of people, it's the sucky disk so far is being used. All right. Oh, Brent has used all of the devices. He was our, our person who's been the go-getter. Whoops. All right, well, thanks for sharing. Um, we will talk about some of these a little bit more, um, but before we get into that part of our discussion, um, I think, let me scroll forward here. We just wanna review, um, we do have our workshop agenda. Um, we're going to transition over here in just a minute to um, Marty will introduce our guest speaker, then we'll have a chance for some Q&A. Um, we'll have a break and then we'll have our activity demos with Q&A, uh, second break, and then we'll get into our joyful hour discussion where we'll ask you to share um, on your investigations and some of the pre-workshop homework. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Marty. Thanks, Cole. Um, so I would like to take a moment to um, introduce Dr. Elgin. Uh, she is a benthic ecologist who has been studying the impacts of invasive species on native food webs for more than 15 years. And as a federal research scientist at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, she oversees a long-term monitoring program for benthic invertebrates in the Great Lakes with a focus on invasive quagga and zebra mussels. She also conducts field and lab experiments to address the many remaining knowledge gaps about these species. And Dr. Elgin is based at NOAA's Lake Michigan Field Station in Muskegon, Michigan. And she greatly appreciates being able to see a big lake from her office window. Today though, she uh, hails from Mora, Minnesota. And so um, we will hear what Ashley has to say. So take it away, Ashley. Yes, good morning, everyone. As, as Marty said, right now I'm visiting with family in Mora, Minnesota. Um, but what I did put up as a backdrop, here's the office where I, I work uh, on, this is the Lake Michigan coast. So I put this here to give an idea of the, the view I, I'm so appreciative of. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now. Okay, of course I had my presentation mid, <laughs> mid presentation when I started. There we go. And you've seen the, the full view of my presentation now? Yep, you're good. Wonderful, okay. <clears throat> so today I will, you know, my, my research program, uh, and thanks to Marty for the introduction. Um, I study what lives in the bottom of the lakes and that is largely in most of the areas of the lakes, invasive mussels. And so my program is focused on the invasive quagga and zebra mussels. And so today I'm gonna give an overview of how they're 
impacting you know, the ecosystem infrastructure and with a focus on recreation at the end. I also can give an update about what the status is uh, based on monitoring work that I and other agencies do where are we at with mussels right now? And what, what did their path look like to get there as far as how did the populations develop? Um, so we have some good graphics over time to show that. So I'll just be giving background to tell you more about the biology and ecology of invasive mussels, talk about the impacts, the status, and at the end, um, the shipwreck impacts. So when I talk about invasive mussels or dracaenid mussels, it's two species. I think of them as invasive cousins. They came from Eurasia. And the, um, the first one that we all learned about was zebra mussels. A lot of times this is the, the only species of the two that people know. And I hope today to convince you that quagga mussels, as far as the ecosystems concerned, are you know have much greater impacts and are the um, much more prevalent species. Um, but zebra mussels are what people know. And in inland lakes, it's certainly more it's still a zebra mussel story. But in the Great Lakes, it's dominated by quagga mussels. So a few things about why are these mussels so um, invasive? Why are they so successful? They are, those two species are among the top five impactful invasive species in the Great Lakes. So first of all, they're fantastic at filtering water. They um, are actively filtering a large proportion of the time. Um, we have underwater video that just shows their siphons are out and they're open and they're actively filtering, it seems through the day and night. There are some times when they close up and aren't as active, but um, most of the time they're very actively filtering water. Um, a conservative estimate is that a small muscle, you know, less than an inch, will be filtering um, a liter of water through a day and taking out food particles. And when you add that up, you, you can have, for example, in Lake Michigan, the, all the entire mass of water going through mussels within a week. And every drop of water could potentially go through a mussel at that filtering capacity. The other thing mussels are good at is attaching to hard surfaces. So in the top left here, here they are attaching to a native mussel. Um, introduction of zebra and quagga mussels, particularly zebra mussels, has been very detrimental to native uh, freshwater mussel populations. In North America, we have an amazing diversity of freshwater mussels, and they have been uh, threatened by the fouling mussels. They'll essentially smother them so the native mussels can no longer open, and they can also be locally depleting the food and um, getting the food resources out of the water and taking that away from the native mussels. Uh, here from Lake Mead, I'll be talking in a bit about, you know, the invasion is not just in the Great Lakes, but it's throughout North America and other places of the world as well. Um, but in Lake Mead, they said this is um, a, down in the lower left, a new pipe after two, four and six months to show how quickly and thoroughly their pipes will be fouled, which shows I mean, major headaches for infrastructure. If you have a place where zebra or quagga mussels are introduced, there now have to be constant engineered solutions to not to preserve hydro infrastructure. And that's just become a way of life in a lot of areas and increasingly out west. Um, there is one of our buoys in the upper right, totally crusted with mussels. This would be over the course of one season deployed. And then a, a preview in the lower right about a shipwreck that, you know, what's that funny texture? It's covered in you know, almost countless mussels. The other thing that's unique about Dracaena mussels is they have very prolific reproductive strategy. So I'm showing the um, freshwater mussel. If you look at that on the right side, their life cycle is actually quite complex. You know, they're going to be, you know, external fertilization, but then these, um, what that is called the glochidia, they then have to attach to a a fish onto the gills of a fish and spend time on the gills of that fish before they can drop off and then become an adult. And sometimes it's a specific species of fish and there are a lot of very creative strategies that native mussels have to get their glochidia onto a native fish. Where Dracaena mussels, they don't have that, that fish stage in there. External fertilization, a planktonic stage where they're just floating around, the villagers are developing and they settle out when they're ready. If they can be very flexible about how long they're floating around, 
And that's another reason that they're very successful in distributing. They can spread during this planktonic larval stage. So I'll be showing you maps very soon. And think about this spreading larval stage as how they're able to spread and, and be found around the lake, an entire lake as large as Lake Michigan, for example, in such a short time. And then they also can dominate the plankton community. So on the top, these are pictures of, of the mussel villagers as they get larger and larger. Uh, once they get to about, let me see that. Um, yeah, about the size of the, the image on the far right, that's about when they're gonna start dropping out of the water column. But while they're in the water column certain times of year, such as right now, they can be a large proportion and even dominate. They'll have more biomass of of the villagers than you will of uh, zooplankton. Fish can eat the villagers, but they don't do as well when they do. It's a, a poorer food source than the zooplankton that they typically eat. And another thing is when they're villagers and in the water, they're filtering at that stage too. They're not filtering as much, but they're then up in the water column filtering, and then the adults are on the bottom filtering. So in that way, they are very good at clearing the water. So now onto some differences between the two, because I'll often I, I lump them together, I speak of them together, but they are quite different. Um, so zebra mussels, they prefer hard surfaces, and you mostly are going to see them on piers. They're attaching to things. They're closer to shore. They like hardscape. So in this image of my background image here, all that rock riprap and, and hardened piers like we have here, and and I know on the other other side of the lake a lot of pier areas, that's really good for zebras. Um, but quaggas, however, can anchor in soft substrates and that gives them, opens up, you know, tons of real estate for them that zebras aren't able to exploit. Zebras have higher attachment strength, whereas quaggas are a little more vulnerable to dislodgement. So um, zebras are more common in rivers and areas with flow than quaggas. Now, big thing that I would say that even beyond the substrate requirements is the temperature requirements. They're very different for the two species. In zebras, they need 12 to 15 degrees Celsius to spawn. Quaggas is five to seven. And so quaggas are able to persist and maintain, have established populations in deep water because of this uh, different requirement for spawning. And as a result, zebras, you're gonna find them at shallow depths. Quaggas can be in shallow and also to deep. Now, what this means for distributions, I've, I've um, given some hints on some of these, but uh, so overall quaggas dominate in the Great Lakes. Zebras are, we rarely find them offshore. And when I say offshore, you know, deeper than 15 meters, about 50 feet, you don't, we, um, they rarely show up in our surveys. If we, in a year we might, I don't know, pull up 300 samples, three to 400 samples and one mussel was in one sample to give you an idea after handling, you know, 100,000 mussels. Um, zebra mussels are more common in the inland lakes. So I'll, I'll show a map in a bit that's showing that where the, the, um, the increased range of the mussels in the in North America. And a lot of it has been zebra mussels, especially spreading through Minnesota. There's been a lot, a lot more infestation. So they're more common in inland lakes, rivers and infrastructure. But then you do get areas where they coexist. So here's a picture I took in Western Lake Erie, a quagga mussel labeled in yellow with zebra mussels on top of it and quagga mussels on top of that. So they, they just have the, this subtle difference in shell form you can just make out here. And so when they say coexist, they can really coexist into what these clumps called druses. And um, this happens in areas that are shallow and productive. Green Bay, Saginaw Bay, Western Lake Erie, as far as the Great Lakes proper go. Um, something else that's special about quagga mussels is they're a little more efficient with their metabolism and they can persist in areas of lower productivity than can zebra mussels. So that also makes the clear cold waters further offshore accessible to them and not zebras. So I've told you about their biology, but then what do they do? So if you think back to the things I said about their excellent filtering water, that's the basis of a lot of these impacts. So first, they re reduce the spring diatom bloom. You know, 
beneficial, um, essential phytoplankton that, that come up when the, when the lake is fully mixing in the spring. There's a big bloom there that kickstarts a lot of productivity in the lakes and they can reduce that because when the lake is fully mixed with their filtering activity, they have access to all that uh, phytoplankton that's throughout the water column and they remove it. The zooplankton don't get it. The larval fish don't get to eat the zooplankton and, and, and up and up the food web. Also by filtering so well, they increase the water clarity and there are nuisance algae. I don't know if you've heard of um, Cladophora. This is a, a benthic filamentous algae that can do very well. And then it, uh, the mat, it, it sloughs off, it comes to shore. It has big rotting mats that are on, that foul the beaches and they stink and they're mushy and people hate it. Um, part of, they do well because the water is more clear for them. So there's more area where the Cladophora can be growing. Another thing you just in general, the energy shifts from pelagic and being up in the water column down to the benthic and being on the bottom zones of the lake. And that's a big reorganization of the food web. I showed that picture earlier about displacing native mussels. They're certainly able to do that in, in, the um, you know, in those areas where the um, invasive mussels and native mussels coexist that, is, that bodes very poorly for the native mussels. And fouling infrastructure, going back to that. And, and to this, I would add cultural artifacts. So how do we know what we know about Dreisina populations? We have, there have been monitoring programs going on um, since the very beginning. And I work for NOAA and we had this amazing data set that actually was started in the 1960s and then was the um, bottom, all these benthic samples were sampled again in the 1980s with another question in mind, but then this gave us really good data on what was the bottom of the lake like before mussels showed up in Lake Michigan. And then we continued on that survey and that's allowed us to see how the mussel population developed. So it just, I, I mean, of course, as a federal um, research scientist, I would say monitoring is important because we, we get good support for monitoring and you never know what you're going to find. And our monitoring program put us in a really uh, good position to understand the Dracaena mussels. So the standard methods we have, one is a ponar grab that's shown in the lower right here. This, it's like a big steel claw that goes down and it gets down, it grabs um, a, a, clot of, a clot of mud from the bottom. You pull that up and then we sort through that with sieves and under a microscope and we pick out the benthic organisms. And then in more recent years, we're adding underwater video as a way to uh, get some more eyes on the bottom of the lake and then finding ways to analyze those images. And there's new technologies I'm working with collaborators from USGS on. They're adding multi-beam echo sounders. So if you think about a just the fanciest fish finder <laughs> in a way, it sends down, um, it sends down the, the um, sound waves at different resolutions and then and different frequencies, I mean. And it'll just give you pictures in different ways of what's happening on the bottom. And we want to refine this so it can better sample the muscle populations. And then even using the um, AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles to go down and collect video, scanning the bottom and collecting video. And then using machine learning and artificial intelligence essentially to process this wealth of data and, and images that's coming up. So now I'd like to show you a little clip of a, um, oops, stop share. Sorry about that. You're hearing the ad on the video I wanna play for you. <laughs> That's what you're hearing right now. Just click the ad, great. Um, sorry, just taking a moment, I need to share screen again. So now you have a sampler that's dropping down to the bottom. Those thick, solid carpets of, of quagga mussels in the bottom of Lake Michigan. So this poem eyes view, and we have a camera right above it. It can be patchy. You can have sandy areas, and you can thread. Ashley, you're starting to freeze up a little. Um, 
you might have some bandwidth issues. Can you try shutting off your camera? No problem. And I will, actually, I'm just gonna stop sharing that. screen. I'm just going to go back to the presentation here. I think showing the video what was what really stressed it out. Is everything looking more smooth now? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. But it, with that video, what it just the, the main point is you, you have these patchy areas on on the bottom, these open sand areas, but largely it's a one solid carpet of millions and actually um the Chicago Tribune just had a, their Sunday paper came out and several of us, different state, um, federal agencies were interviewed and it's about the situation of quagga mussels in Lake Michigan. And uh, to them, I provided an estimate of 300 trillion mussels currently in Lake Michigan. A trillion is, a, that's a lot of <laughs> zeros. So it's a large, large amount. Um, and yeah, and so with the sampling, it, you know, we have a large area to cover, but we visit the same sites every five years and it's given us a nice picture of their populations, which I will show. Sorry. There we go. So now these maps show what we find from these Ponar surveys. And I'll bring you, show you to the top row you have zebra mussels were first coming up in the mid 1990s in Lake Michigan. They were first found in Lake St. Clair and Western Lake Erie as uh, when they, they first came up. But in the late, I think it was 89, the first one was found in Lake Michigan. And we found that zebra mussels going across the top, they largely colonized around the outside of the lake. But see how they were able to colonize new areas and kind of cover the entire perimeter of the lake just within that five years. And in 2005 though, the populations are already starting to, to wane and reduce. So then you look to the bottom, what's happening during that? Well, quagga mussels were not yet found in the mid 1990s. In the 2000, they were only found up in the North. By 2005, look at the progress that they made. They've entirely rimmed the lake and then the darker blue color indicates even higher density. And then in, at that time, zebras are already going down. By 2010, quagga mussels are found throughout the entire lake bed, not just around the lake, even the deepest areas going across. And by then, we're not finding zebra mussels in this survey anymore. And in 2015, we just find even higher, higher numbers. They're spreading more, higher numbers into the, the um, middle of the lake in the deeper regions. And we continue not to have zebra mussels. I have a similar series of maps here for Lake Huron. And it's a similar story in that uh, in 2000, zebra mussels are coming in. They're more distributed around the lake by 2003. But then in 2003, that's when quagga mussels were on the scene. And from there on out, they colonize near shore areas, colonize the entire lake bed, and then zebra mussels are no longer found. Now for Lake Ontario, I don't have the, those blue maps prepared, but I will just show that um, in this more um, basic graph, showing that their density did increase over time. So going on the x-axis, you're going through time starting in the early 90s up to present day. And the, the density was low for a while. It jumped up and it peaked in the early 2000s. And the top panel shows what's happening in this mid-depth area of 31 to 90 meters. But then the lower one shows that in the very deepest areas, the population has developed a little slowly. You haven't had this big, what we call a boom and then a bust in the population. It's been more a, a gradual increase over time. So now to compare Ontario numbers right next to the um, Huron and Michigan, I'll put those in and Ontario is lower than Michigan and higher than Huron in general. And again, this is in the one well, the 31 to 90 meters. You see a lot of differences among the lakes because they have different levels of, of productivity. They have um, just different 
the lakes, I, I think of the five lakes as having five distinct personalities. And uh, Lake Huron is more similar to Lake uh, Superior and that has high, um, lower calcium, which doesn't support as many muscles. I'll get into that more in a moment. Um, but then, so th those differences are very clear in the top figure. But when you look at the bottom figure at greater than 90 meters, I've said many times that depth is the great equalizer. And that when you get to the really cold, low productivity areas across all three lakes, the muscle population is developing very, very, in a very similar way. But uh, still at decent numbers and not to be ignored, the, um, the densities that we have way offshore because a majority of the lakes are actually um, area-wise are greater than 90 meters. So it's very important to, to know what's happening at those greater depths. Uh, Lake Erie is a little more complicated because it has th have three distinct basins. So I broke out the, um, this figure here is from a paper by Karataev et al. 2021 about Lake Erie. And the Western basin is, is the shallow productive area. The Eastern basin is the kind of mid depth, but has a lot of issues with hypoxia. And the central basin is, sorry, the Eastern basin is is more as higher muscle populations. It's the central basin at, is more um, still shallow and has hypoxia issues. When you put these together lake wide, the main story I want you to focus on here for Lake Erie is that the muscles were much higher back in the 90s and they've been lower since and they're kind of bouncing around over these last couple, really the last 20 years. Um, but even at those levels, the muscles are enough to have major ecosystem impacts. And then the last lake, saving the, the um, best for last, Lake Superior is admittedly my favorite lake and that's where I grew up was on Lake Superior. And they are, this is where you have the lowest populations. So these are occurrence records from a USGS site and just look at how few points there are in Lake Superior versus the rest of the, the other lower four lakes. Um, there are some areas where we have very localized populations that are, are limited. When they sample the water, they find the mussel villagers in the water, but there aren't as many settled out populations that they're able to find in, in the sediment. And one, a lot of those villagers do not survive. And I think it's because the calcium levels aren't high enough. And, um, and therefore you just have these very distinct localized small populations. And, Lake Superior has maintained at this level for quite a while. Putting um, all the lakes together side by side and scoring them on a, a similar scale, this is, I look to something called the State of the Great Lakes Reports. And a main reason I put this in is I wanted to highlight this as a, night, as a good research for a resource for teaching in your classrooms. This is um, report, these reports come out about every three years. And there are, I think at this point, is it 47 different sub indicators in many different areas that indicate water quality, groundwater, climate change, native and invasive species. And you could look through and see what, um, look for these either uh, kind of summary highlight reports or a detailed technical report in all these different areas that could be a good resource for any of your, your lessons that are um, related to the Great Lakes. So I, I put the link here and I, I believe you'll have access to my presentation as well. So you can look for it there. And um, so in general, Lake Superior is, is scored as being good and unchanging, that Lakes Michigan, Huron and Ontario are deterior deteriorating and poor and Lake Erie is in fair condition because it has moderate levels of mussels and it's been improving because it is much lower than it used to be. Now zooming out and looking at this as a, on a national scale, we have um, many more occurrences happening. So the Great Lakes was like the beachhead for the invasion and it's spread from there. Notice how much it's spread over the river network. And um, this is a picture from 2011. When I fast forward now to 2019, Look at the number in the circled area, many more occurrences through the middle of the United States, including many more in Minnesota and Texas is, I'm getting a lot of alerts for new occurrences, Texas. There's more out West. 
So I'm going to toggle back and forth between the two of those. So you just see the changes that are happening. Um, Lake Winnipeg, looking up north to our, our Canadian neighbors, has been invaded by zebra mussels as well. So now uh, to, to finish up this part of my talk, I want to just focus on then how this muscle fouling, their incredible ability to attach to things, affects historical artifacts such as shipwrecks. Um, you know, there's, I, I put here a link, there's B-roll of mussels in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So you can take an underwater tour and just see how thoroughly uh, the, the wrecks and the artifact, artifacts are impacted. Um, the picture you're seeing here, this is the same view eight years apart and how it, it was colonized in that time. This was um, the Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast National Marine Sanctuary was just very recently announced. And I put this up here because this is the one of the images they had advertising it. And I see this image, all I can see are the muscles. I, it with, it's like a, a muscles in the shape of a ship is when I, when I think of this, because I'm so muscle centric. So then how is it that the muscles impact shipwrecks? They, on, in the first pass, they improve water clarity. So therefore more people can see the ship, shipwrecks. And that's a, actually a very immediately desirable thing. Divers enjoy diving in clear water and it makes things, every, everything easier to see. So that I put up there is the, the main positive that people see about it. But then I have a, a list of negative impacts. You limit access for detailed features um, to detailed features. So if you want to measure and document features on the shipwrecks, it now is interfering with that. And you might not be able to, to find plaques that are um, in other very important find distinguishing features. They could potentially be degrading the wood <clears throat> by attaching to it. <clears throat> and also accelerate me uh, metal corrosion because their attachment is by this Bissell threads they have, they have um, a glue that they'll attach the Bissell threads to hard surfaces and it's in removing that or even chemical properties of that adhesive itself could be compromising the wood or the metal. And then there's also the potential for loading density. Um, each individual muscle is very light, but collectively they could, you know, it's, it could be a lot of weight that are then adding an uh, additional structural load on some older and sensitive structures. I had, couldn't help but to put the, it's a very bad screenshot of um, a bad image, but this is a wreck of the Lady Elgin. So given my name, I was on a call once and someone said, did you know about the wreck of the Lady Elgin? That was a very important wreck. That was one of the highest loss of lives and it occurred in, in Lake Michigan. So I'd looked into it a bit and, and then I found these pictures and this is showing the Lady Elgin, but covered in muscles. So I thought, I, of course I have to include this. Um, in my presentation. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up here. I just, I definitely want to leave plenty of time for your questions, but I always have to thank that I work with a wonderful team of people um, who are the, uh, my federal colleagues, as well as Sigler. It's the, our Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. That's through University of Michigan, but we have several consortium partners with that. And USGS, I work with several researchers there and EPA because it's, it's, a, it's a big lift to track these muscles across all the lakes and we, we have a lot of coordination across agencies to do it. And with that, I am open to your questions. Well, thank you so much for um, that presentation. I think it was um, really good and super informative. I especially like the pieces that kind of delineate the difference between uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Mm -hmm. So um, I think since we don't have um, a ton of people on, why don't we go ahead and try uh, flipping on our cameras? Mm -hmm. And then there, if, you, if anyone had any questions for, um, for Dr. Elgin, I encourage you to unmute and, and go ahead and ask it. We can, I guess we can do that by um, raising hands and then I'll give you a call. So we're not mm -hmm. walking on each other, but I know there was at least, and I received some through the chat too, okay. but I'd like would, to give yeah, people an opportunity. I'd like to give people an opportunity to um, raise their hands and um, ask their questions directly of, of uh, Dr. Elgin.
So Brian, I think I'll start with you because I did see that you had a question. Um, so would you be so kind as to ask Dr. Elgin your, your question? You are muted currently. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Elgin, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, very interesting. And every time I hear things about uh, mussels or invasive species, I learn more. So it's, it's awesome. Um, my question was, are either of the two more aggressive than the other if, if and when they do coexist in the Great Lakes? In, in, in general, quaggas are going to have the upper hand on zebra mussels in the Great Lakes proper because they're able to, even when it, as food gets lower, they're able to um, exist on lower levels of food okay. and they even have longer siphons. So when they put out those siphon tubes to filter water, they can extend their tubes even further. So imagine like they're reaching up to get the ball higher than oh, what wow. the zebras can. And they, they just, you know, get to that food first. So they, they definitely have a more competitive advantage and it's a big reason that they, um, you know, only in the certain more productive, most shallow areas can zebras hold on. Otherwise, the, the quaggas will dominate and displace the zebras. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one other question I had was um, the calcium levels in the Great Lakes. Are, is there a huge difference in Lake Superior's levels that might be contributing to the population? That's right. That's been the main factor implicated because it's, it's not because Lake Superior is cold. Mussels can handle cold. It's more the calcium levels. And okay. then um, some further evidence of this is, you know, as, as you flow from Lake Superior, you get into North Channel of, um, of Lake Huron, that's still lower um, calcium levels. And we don't have many mussels there. Calcium levels then start to increase as you get into the main basin of Lake Huron. And then that's where we're seeing more muscles. So there's definitely a gradient of calcium from low to medium to high as you go from Lake Superior to Lake Huron to Lake Michigan. And okay. the muscles kind of follow that gradient of low, medium and high as well. Okay. Um, is it, are the calcium levels dependent on carbon dioxide levels in the lake? A lot of times that calcium's, um, it, is, it can be influenced by that and acidification due to carbon dioxide. Um, a lot of it is, is just the, the base geology really okay. influences the, the calcium levels and that's gonna have the, the biggest impact. But we're just starting to get measurements on what are the, the levels of inorganic carbon and the, um, you know, the, for example, the CO2 levels of dissolved CO2 in, in the water. We're just starting to get baseline measurements of that because I, maybe you've heard of ocean acidification and, and that's of greater concern for NOAA going forward of climate change. And yeah. we're trying to convince them we need to be getting baseline measurements of the Great Lakes as well. So we're not an ocean, but we're still water and we're still, and the, the chemistry is a little different, but this is still something we should be tracking and keeping an eye on. Because okay. that, that could, um, at, you know, if the water becomes more acidic, that's not good for anything that needs to build a shell. And that would stress the muscles, but it would stress a lot of other organisms too. Right. And that, that was one of my concerns. I'm just wondering if anybody, you answered my question, is mm -hmm. monitoring those levels. Yeah. We're just, uh, and there have been some measures, but we're, we're starting and we have a, a new research scientist at our lab, uh, Dr. Reagan Herrera, and she is, she's really spearheading getting some good monitoring going in the Great Lakes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a couple other questions now that have rolled in once awesome. the calcium conversation <laughs> uh, started going. And so, um, Ashley, I'm not sure if you see them oh, or I, not. I can um, you do. Okay. Um, so one of the first ones I see is, um, I'll just read them in case there are folks who are not tracking on the, the chat. So calcium, so one of the questions coming in from Olivia is, so calcium is the primary limiting factor of muscle growth in the lakes? And that's her question. I wouldn't say it's, it's primary, uh, but it, it certainly is a limiting factor. It can, it seems to really affect the success of 
muscles the villagers surviving and the villagers establishing, they're very sensitive to it. So if those small villagers can't translate to large muscles, that's gonna keep the population down. But there are other limiting factors. Temperature does limit their growth. Um, low food levels still limits their growth. Predation, there are some fish that eat them. That's gonna limit their populations. So I couldn't say which is greater, but it, many things can limit their growth. And then there are some areas where they're, they're all working against the muscles and Lake Superior is one of those. They have many things going against the growth. Hmm. So um, following on that, a question from Leanne is, <clears throat> if the mussels are coming from Asia, what's happening in Asia where they came from? And the thing I would add on to that is what's eating them there? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. great questions. And that's, it, it lets me bring up an exciting story. So, and I'll, I'll clarify it's, um, so more uh, Eurasia and actually it's more Eastern Europe of it's the Black and Caspian Seas and the Dnieper River in Ukraine, that's where you're, you're finding these mussels, where they're coming from. They came over in the ballast water ships and to a pretty similar climate that they found from Eastern Europe to the Great Lakes. Um, in their native ranges, they are, there are more fish that eat them. And one fish that loves to eat mussels is the round goby. Mm -hmm. The round goby is also here. So Imagine you, it's like you transfer to another high school and you find someone's like, hey, I know you. And then maybe they're like a rival and you, you know, eat them. That, that's essentially what round goby are doing. They're the most effective predators on mussels. And there is some evidence that in locally, they're able to suppress the mussel populations um, by eating them because they like to eat the small ones. So they keep them from getting established. Um, so round goby is one reason that they're more limited back home. And, you know, it, there aren't, a lot of deep water cold environments in their native range, like what they have in the Great Lakes. So in a way it's like they got to the Great Lakes and they got to say Lake Michigan, which just seems like it's built to support trillions of mussels. And they're, they're just doing really well. They don't have heavy predation. They're able to grow low and slow and just slow and steady cover the whole lake. So it's a unique environment that they don't, ex they're not experiencing back home. They really thrive here. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question that sort of follows along the calcium level pieces and then an uh, impacts question. So Susan asks, uh, what determines the calcium levels and do mussels do more damage to wooden or metal shipwrecks? Well, the, these are awesome questions that put me right at the limit of my, my knowledge, I'll, I'll admit. So first of all, um, back to it's the, the calcium is largely determined by the geology in that region. More limestone deposits, you're going to have more calcium carbonate in the water, as is the case for Lake Michigan. Um, I, I think um, uh, Lake Superior is more of a basalt bedrock and isn't, isn't as high calcium. So that, that's a larger determinant. As far as um, I would have to defer to someone else who knows more, has done more research because I, I haven't researched directly, you know, the, the impact on wood versus metal, but that's a great thought. I had that same question myself when putting this presentation together. Okay, well, those are, um, those are really good questions. Let me see, I think I'm going to... And I haven't been able to pull up the chat for some reason, I'm not able, it's disappeared for me. So yeah, if, is there anything else I've missed, missed in the chat? Please keep letting me know. Yeah, if anyone would like to hop in, they can raise their hand. Otherwise I'll pull some other questions that I've um, seen come through. Oh, it looks like Brian raised his hand. So Brian, what's your question? Um, I have a question about natural pathogens that the quaggas might have or the zebras, yeah, you know, um, like bacterias or mm -hmm. viruses or fungus or anything that might help reduce their populations. There, there has been somewhere to look for if there are viruses associated with the mussels. Um, and certainly they do carry some viruses. There hasn't been evidence of them being at a level that is, I guess, controlling their population. No one's made that connection yet. There has been some concern that maybe there's a virus that they could harbor that are harmful 
to other species. Mm -hmm. um, but that it's a pretty uh, fresh area that we we don't. It, that's hard to track down. But that mm -hmm. but you're you're that's it's totally the right thought of um, you know this whole it's called the like the predator release hypothesis of why something does well in a novel area. It's not just predators, but it's also disease. And mm -hmm. you know, did they escape diseases by going to a new place? Um, and that's, you know, people have been researching it, but there, there aren't any strong areas that they've, they've brought a lot of diseases with them or strong evidence of that that's affected them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Leanne also has a question. You wanna ask it, Leanne? Sure. Um, good morning. I just read a, an article out of Texas about the spread of the, um, the muscles by pleasure boaters. And it kind of looks like that was a big spread in um, the rivers on your maps. But I know like for at least 20 years here, we've talked about it. Has there been any impact on pleasure boating and them cleaning out their boats before they move them? Or is that just a lost cause now? Well, um, there are definitely some success stories there. So I'm really glad you brought it up there. You know, we, we say that it's is the large shipping boats and bring in ballast water that help them leapfrog all the way over to the Great Lakes. And then from spread within North America, I think it's a, a major vector has been on recreational boats. That's certainly how mussels made it from the Great Lakes out to Lake Mead, for example, way out west. That was on someone's recreational boat. Um, and so out west, because they're, they're investing a lot of money in prevention and boat checking stations, heavy fines if you're found um, transporting mussels and they've been you know ideally they're doing what we should have been doing 20 years ago to prevent them from exporting out of the Great Lakes area but you know I, I get alerts and updates from say the Montana Department of Fishing Game and and their their intensive efforts so I don't think it's a lost cause uh, it you know they a, a phrase that we use a lot in invasive bio invasion um, science is slow the spread. So you may not be able to completely stop them and something's going to, something will get through, you know, it, it's just, we see that, but you're slowing the spread of it. So instead of explosive threats um, spread out West, it's maybe more pocketed, smaller localized invasions. So never a lost cause prevention is always the best thing. And I'm really heartened that out West they're investing in prevention so much. And has anyone ever heard of um, muscle sniffing dogs? I don't know if it's worth looking into. There, there's a program, it was in Canada and they're doing this out west in the US as well. They've trained dogs to sniff out villagers and muscles and they're able to pick up the scent of, and they've tested these dogs and you can have a tiny, you know, these villagers are less than a millimeter in size, you know, fraction, fraction of an inch. And these dogs go around, they sniff the boats, and they can, and they'll, you know, they sit down and they, they do their thing if, if they smell mussels. And that's been one of the innovations they've used. And they say any dog, it can, it's not a wow. certain breed. It's just a dog is heavily motivated by balls or treats. They say those dogs are good. I'm like, oh, my dog would be great at that. <laughs> but definitely look into it. Look, look up muscle sniffing dogs. And I'm, I can imagine kids in your classroom would really love seeing something like that. I, they have, I think, a couple, couple canines on staff uh, with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and I did mm -hmm. post a link to a NPR news article uh, that Great. relates to that. So if you're mm -hmm. curious, you can check that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no one else has any. Leanne, did you have mm -hmm. another question? Well, I, I did because I'm curious about the effect of the mussels given the severe drought out west and mm. you know the whole climate change and infrastructure push how is that all like coming to a head with the mussels and you know are you involved in any of that i have a i, I have colleagues doing research out west um i haven't been too involved with it but one thing you know and i see those pictures of say lake mead and these other reservoirs and as the water level is going way down First thing I think is, oh, the mussels are losing a lot of habitat. That's going to kill a lot of mussels. So that in that way could really knock back the mussel populations. But unfortunately, once they're doing, the conditions are good, they're just 
they're very good at coming roaring, roaring back again. Well, thanks so much for answering um, all these questions. We're about Great to questions. transition. Tra <laughs> yeah, really good questions. Um, we're about to transition over into uh, career pathway Q&A. But before we do that, I have one other uh, question that I just would really like to ask that came in. And the question is, if muscles are such great water filterers, is there any way that they might be helpful in water treatment plants to purify water? Um, it's a great thought. In some ways, yes. But this is a good reminder that clean, clear water does not mean clean water. And that you know, if muscles are there, they're filtering out the food particles that they want. It doesn't mean that they'll get out contaminants and chemicals in the water that we don't want. Those could very well pass through. They're not going to be filtering all of those out. So they could be used maybe you know, at some stage of initially clearing the water, but as far as really getting it clean for human consumption, I wouldn't put muscles to task for that. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I think that that then concludes this part of the um, workshop and we can just transition over into career stuff because we're finding from um, our, our workshop participants that this part's really interesting for, uh, for folks. And so, um, I don't know, Ashley, if mm -hmm. you, if we need your screen shared anymore, um, yep. you can probably did, take that off. And I did have one quick slide that I had here. I just had this from another presentation because I recently did a, a NOAA, it was a national sea grant career panel for some students. So I put this together to show my path. And so I'll back up here. Perfect. I started out studying marine invasive species for my master's. And then I decided I wanted, and I was out studying um, invasive green crab in the Gulf of Maine, because I'd always had an interest of invasive species because I grew up in the Great Lakes area and I knew about zebra mussels and sea lamprey from a young age. Then after studying the marine environment, I decided I want to get back to freshwater invasive species and I actually want to get back towards Great Lakes research um, and work in the Great Lakes region. So I studied crayfish and I studied the the rusty crayfish has shown, this is my hand, it's pinching the crap out of my finger here. This is a rusty crayfish I studied in Northern Wisconsin and in Upper Peninsula Lakes. Um, but I also did a side project where I studied the Louisiana crayfish studied as shown here in the lower left. And I went to China where Louisiana crayfish is invasive there. So there are a lot of species from China that have come here. And then there are a lot of species from the US and North America that have gone to China that are causing problems. And Louisiana crayfish is one of those. So I was talking to farmers about, you know, once a crayfish comes in, that rice paddy can no longer be used for rice. Oh, but now they can farm crayfish there instead. And those have a, a price at the market. So I was just trying to get a feel for which would they rather have. And it was a kind of a, the, the social dimension of dealing with invasive species. I found them to be very pragmatic about it. If you can get more money per pound on that, the crayfish, it's not so bad that we lost a rice paddy. So it was very interesting attitudes. And they were um, happily eating them as well, as we do here. Um, was, here's me in the lower right, small lakes in Northern Wisconsin and UP, small boats, wetsuits. This is the kind of stuff I was doing to study crayfish impacts. And then I got a postdoc on, and I went to big boats and did big boats to study a tiny organism is what I, I do now. And this is one of our NOAA research vessels. Um, my research shifted then to another bottom dwelling benthic invasive species. And that's kind of the spiral that's brought me to uh, the quagga mussels. And that's why I've, my research has been focused on for these last eight years. So that's just a, a, a quick leading because I had the slide prepared of the path and it was a little winding. I, I did um, my undergrad, I actually got a secondary teaching certificate to be a biology teacher, and I was all ready to do that. And then I decided, oh, well, I'm, I'd like to do a little more research first. And then I like, well, I'll be a college professor. And then I found out, and then I got really into the research. And then I'm at a, a research laboratory. Um, so I, I do like to have opportunities to reach out and talk to teachers. I've mentored a lot of students along the way, a lot of undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and I, I value that part of my job very much. So that's my little lead in. And any, any specific questions, and I'll stop sharing screen here.
I um, really enjoy your your the picture walkthrough. I think that that, mm -hmm. that was a very succinct and good. Um, so it actually sounds like you've had um, a couple of defining moments along your career path. Mm -hmm. uh, the one I would like to ask specifically is, what was it that finally made you decide to become a benthic ecologist? I well, it was it was interesting when I decided I wanted to go more in the research path. There was no question in my mind I was going to study invasive species. And then it's, I found that um, I was open to whatever system to study it in, but I kept finding I was, I was working on benthic species and it just was a common theme that was going through. But one thing I didn't, um, yeah, when I was working out in the, the oceans though, that's where it did come clear to me, I wanna get back to the Great Lakes and I, I wanna do that. And at one point I was working a job as a, as a program coordinator for marine science after I got my master's and I talked to Tom Nalepa, who is my predecessor in this position, I talked to him about finding summer internships. And I, I got off to the phone and I thought, gosh, so there's a Great Lakes Research Lab in Michigan for, no, for NOAA. And here I'm helping students get internships that I would, I wanna have that internship. I wanna do that stuff. So then that, after that phone call, I made the decision, I'm gonna, if I go back to grad school, it's gonna be in the Great Lakes. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna position myself to be working at that lab. And then so many years later, I had his job. So that was a very, if you think about a pivotal moment of, you, you know, you have so many branches and in, in, in decisions to make. I just kept turn right, turn right, turn left. And it all spiraled me to where I am now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. awesome. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, as an extension educator, I appreciate is a uh, circuitous career path. Oh, yeah, just. And so I, and I, I think that at least I take a lot of comfort in knowing that it seems a wide majority of people, there is not a straight shot. Like there may be mm -hmm. the rare individual who knows in the beginning what they're going mm -hmm. to do. But I think this can be comforting for young people too, to understand that it's okay to not necessarily know and to have these opportunities for exploration. And then to hear from successful individuals, like, guess what? It was like that for me too, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think can yeah. be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So um, another question I have for you is, what kind of support have you had as a woman in your profession? And have you had uh, any mentors? You mentioned uh, Dr. Nalepa, but are there, mm -hmm. there are others? Yeah, I, I had, I had good, good support along the way. Um, you know, it came sometimes in an unexpected, it, it could be a mentor who I didn't have much contact with, but gave me really pivotal advice at the right moment. And then I have other people who are just, who really helped me. So one thing during my undergrad, you know, I was really focused on, I was getting my teaching certification. I was doing student teaching experiences and all this extra things. And I didn't have and my summer jobs were more geared towards that. I didn't get a lot of research experience during my undergrad. Then when I was applying for grad school, I was told, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't, I wasn't reaching out to the professors directly. I was not having good success getting into programs and I had a bad, um, or I had a lacking track record of doing research. And then I found a program in a, at Smith College and a really excellent mentor that helped me get that initial experience, just get my feet wet. But then I dove in and got field experience, intensive lab experience, everything. And he mentored me and he helped me bridge that divide to realize you can do it. And it, it made me realize that that's the biggest thing is, um, you know, just don't stand in, I had to not stand in my own way. I, you know, I, at one point when, when the job that I have now, when that started, when that was first posted, I was like, oh, I'm not gonna apply for that. I won't get that job. And someone said, well, how about you let them decide instead of you decide? And I'm like, it was one of those moments. And I was like, oh gosh, yes. And you know, my mom's been telling me that all, she would, like, I wouldn't want to ask a question. And my mom would say, why are you making up their mind for them? You, the answer is no, if you don't ask it. And so I've been hearing that from my mom all the time growing up and then hear it professionally from someone else. I was like, gosh, my mom is so right. Gosh, yeah, she's so... She knows everything. And, and professionally, it's very true too. And sometimes it's really scary to put yourself out there. But otherwise, if you don't ask, the answer is automatically no. And you made up their mind for them. So that was some of the, like that key advice and mentorship that I got at key times that made me stick my neck out and try for that next thing. 
So let them tell you no. Let invite, them tell you no. Invite them. <laughs> invite them. You know, why, why should I make up their mind for them by never asking? And that's what <clears throat> it came down to. Such simple advice and really good. Yeah. Really good. Mm -hmm. We have, well, we have things lighting up in the chat about oh, moms. Thanks. Mom oh. is always right. Always it's listen so to right. your mother. Your mm -hmm. mother was a wise woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, it's mortifying advice to get when you're a teenager and it's just asking about something silly. It's like, well, you don't know if you don't ask. And I'm like, oh, mom. Yeah, and then right. down the line, it, it, I'm like, oh, it got me my dream job. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Mom. So maybe there was some good in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So this kind of follows on those coattails, but I'll ask it anyway, in case yeah. you have more to add to that. And the next question I have is, have you ever received great advice as you move through your career? And what was it? Well, and it, you know, that was great advice. Another bit that I got was really helpful is when I was thinking about going into a PhD program and I was really, I was, didn't think I could do it. And a professor said, you don't have to be a genius to get a PhD, but you have to be determined and you have to be willing to stick with it. And I was like, oh yeah, I can stick with it. Like I'm, I have the grit. I can do it. I can do it. And, and when I thought of it that way, instead of being just intellectually overwhelmed by it and what this idea of what I thought someone getting a PhD with what that is, it demystified it in a way to say, no, it is the hard work. And to just look at it that way, it shifted my perspective and it helped me get through some really hard times. And I'm like, oh, this is the moment where I just need to, you know, tough up and get through it. You have to be tenacious, like a zebra yeah. muscle. Yes. But you just got to keep <laughs> holding on. You got to hold on. <laughs> and, you know, that does bring another bit of advice I got. And this is what a professor who I didn't interact with much during PhD, but he said it, a very simple thing. He's like the resubmission rates for grants from women are abysmal, was his word. He said, if a woman submits a grant and then she doesn't get that grant, she tends to not resubmit. She's like that was rejected. I'm not going to resubmit. The more times you resubmit a proposal, the more likely it's going to improve and you'll increase success of getting it. And um, it, that's just another reminder of don't be discouraged by that rejection. Cause I know I personally take rejection very hard. I'm seeing in a, a, a chat, you know, the comp, maybe lower confidence and it can be a female issue. I totally relate to that. And you just have to kind of fight, fight against that and say, well, um, is that just the story I'm telling myself about the situation? Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> right. Well, there's so much good Good stuff going through the chat here. I do want to take a moment just to read it in case people aren't mm -hmm. tracking it. Uh, from Brian, mom gave me a lot of great advice and I appreciate today her willingness to let me explore and fail, which gives me direction <laughs> and help me find my own way. Mm -hmm. And from Cole, no today doesn't mean no tomorrow. Thanks for that, Cole. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's a good point. And there's also, I saw something in the chat here. Dads can be wise too. Absolutely, I had a lot of, a lot of support from my my dad as well. And I had, I would say more unusual interests as, as a kid growing up, I just mucking around. I wanted like to dissect roadkill, which is maybe not that common. I like, could I, and yeah. And so I wasn't, I just was really into things and my, um, I was never discouraged from it. And that's major because it's early discouragement. That's a, that's a killer. You know, and I, yes. I didn't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I remember receiving some advice. Well, it wasn't really advice from my father, but it was just a simple question. And I was mm -hmm. humming and hawing about going, going back to school. And I said, well, you know, if I go back to school, when I finish, I'm going to be 30. And he says, well, you're going to be 30 anyway. I love it. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. going to be 30 anyway. Yep. <laughs> so how am I going to spend my time? <laughs> yep. Yeah, you're, that's, that's good advice. And when I started the PhD program, I, I went to Notre Dame for my PhD and I was one of the oldest people starting the program there. And I was like, oh, I'm an old lady now. You know, I'm, I'm the older one in the batch. And, and I was just, that's it's fine. I was going to yeah. be that age anyway, like you say. Right. Well, Leanne thinks that she might draw the line yeah. at roadkill. So we've got some debate among the group <laughs> about that particular topic. Um, and, oh, Anne, I see that you have your hand raised. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah, just um, so you mentioned before the so this started that you're a mom as well. So, yeah. and you said you had a daughter. So are any of these lessons um, 
manifesting them? Are you seeing them as a parent? You know, we have teachers here, they mm -hmm. may be mentoring their students to be scientists or, you know, they're in their own families. Any mm -hmm. ways that you're, you know, using this great advice you're hearing? Yeah, um, well, with her, um, I find that she somehow comes back because she's in daycare, she's in preschool now, she's three and a half. And she'll talk about some, <laughs> she'll talk about some things being gross or icky outside. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not bugs aren't icky and I think maybe she's hearing it from some of her teachers like ew gross and it's just kind of counteracting that and always just being really excited about it and primarily she is excited about things rather than being like ew gross so we just try to say that these aren't gross even though you know like I I don't there's some things I don't I'm not into slugs I but if I see a slug now I I'll still be like cool instead of I do want to be like oh gross <laughs> but um but we do have a ravine close to our house and we go down and we hunt down the amphipods. So mm -hmm. to hear her at that time, she was two something and say the word amphipod, just my heart was singing. I was like, oh my gosh, she's saying amphipod. And she's talking about amphipods when we're not down there saying she wants to go hunt down amphipods. So then I, so it's just exposure, exposure and enthusiasm is what we use in our, our home. Yeah, so yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so we still have about four minutes left of Q&A, but I do want to say if there is anyone that has a direct question that they would like to ask, please feel free to raise your hand and um, we can and we can get you can ask it. Um, so just keep that in mind as we keep uh, moving along. I do have um, some other questions, though, here. Uh, let's see. What has been your biggest challenge as a woman in your career? I was thinking about that. I'm glad I had this question ahead, you know, to, to have an idea of what you might ask about. <laughs> My biggest challenge is managing other people's projects. And that's maybe just my own personality trait. But I found I take on kind of this, a, lar a, a larger share of making sure all the details are being taken care of, all the projects being covered, the budget is right, that we're getting all the reporting done. And we have, there's a lot of bureaucracy to doing research. And sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm shouldering a bit and I'm like, am I being the mom to some of my coworkers? Because I'm taking care of details and making sure everyone's where they need to be and all that. And I, and I, don't, I don't know if it's just, I have primarily male coworkers. When I came on as a, as a research scientist, I was the only woman in our lab that of, of the research scientists. So it was 12 men and me. Now, in the last five years, we've had some more hires and they've been more women. So now there's a small group of us, so four women researchers and the remainder male researchers. So it's really hard. I don't, I, I, I'd never like to say this is just a gender thing. I just say this is more of a personality thing. And it's everything's a people have different tendencies but I, I do catch myself in situations being like maybe I'm I'm doing too much work for other people to make sure everything's running smoothly and that's it's just a lot of extra work for me so that's one tendency I I'm like how do I step away out of, step out of that role and that's my own challenge of how I manage my position but I do feel like I'm listened to I will say that um I I had some experiences earlier on where I felt my voice wasn't being heard, but I don't, luckily I don't run into that as very much that I would attribute to being a, a woman in my position. And I, I'm thankful for that. I work with really good people. Well, that's awesome. Yes. I've turned mom into a verb. I now call it momming. Yeah. <laughs> Which my 12 year old daughter does not love, but you know, yeah. she's stuck with it. Mm -hmm. So, well, you mentioned earlier on when we were talking, oh, I see Leanne has a question. Um, I'm gonna hold mine and make sure Leanne gets okay. a chance to ask hers. So Leanne, what's your question? Mm -hmm. Well, it's more of a comment because um, when I was able to teach at UW-Milwaukee, um, we were teaching student teachers and uh, the reading teacher, I was the math person, she would always put all the males in one group, which I was like, why do you do that? She said, because men have a tendency to sit back and let the women take over and do all the work. Mm -hmm. And um, it was brilliant because they couldn't hide in a group. So it was just something I kind of put in my back pocket and took forward with me. So 
That's just my comment. Yeah. One way of, I guess, of approaching management in a, in a group of youth. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Well, we are at 1015. And so um, we've, we are scheduled for a five minute break. And Ashley, I just, I wanna thank you so much for your time and all of your words today about both career path and science. That's been great. And Ashley will be um, sticking around through the joyful hour and participating in one of the breakout groups. So um, we'll have more time to interact with her a little bit more. And um, we do have her information in the Google Drive, including an email address. And so there should be an open line of communication Absolutely. Uh, now. So yeah. with that, um, it's 1015, uh, at least by my clock. Mm -hmm. So let's be back here at uh, 1020. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, from your, for your engagement. This has been really great. Hi, Perry. Hi there. Are you at the bike shop? Is that what I heard? Yep. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, absolutely. So Perry, how hard did you get hit by the storms we had last week? Um, oh, hi, Olivia. Uh, not bad, actually. We were out of town, and I was kind of worried a little bit, but we lost power for a while. I'm not sure how long. I just got a text that our power was out from WPS, and I don't know when it was turned back on. Um, one old popple, the top got blown off, but that didn't affect anything else. So how about you? Uh, we got hit pretty hard. We had a tornado just down the road, uh, and we lost power for a week, and yeah. just got it back. And uh, yeah, it, it's been busy. We're doing a lot of neighborhood cleanup. Wow. Yeah. Not good. So Olivia and Perry, how far apart are you guys? Where do you both live? How far apart are you? Perry, uh, he's in Manaqua. I think you're about 30 minutes north of me from where we live. Where, where are you exactly? Highway E, uh, 107, uh, Irma? Tomahawk J, on J. Okay, okay. Highway 107. Yeah, about a half hour away. So really big system that came through. Yep. Yeah, we were actually up in Cuyuna when it went through and Bemidji got nailed. I know, you're going to have to look me up next time you come. I was um, so surprised and pleased to hear that you um, were up in the Cuyuna area. I'm like, oh. If only I'd known. <laughs> so where's your place? Well, we're on a, a tiny lake called Hamlet Lake. And so we are, the closest town is Deerwood. 
And okay. so, I mean, you drove like right through it in oh, order wow. to get to yeah. get there. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, and it was, we, it was cool. I'd, we'd never been there before. And really my first time in that part of the state, other than just driving through on 169 or whatever, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's really ride. pretty. And yeah, the yeah. trails are great. I've, I've been on them just a little bit with my daughter and really enjoyed them. Yeah. They're phenomenal. And yeah, we just camped in the Cuyuna, Cuyuna city campground, which was yeah, whatever, but <laughs> Oh, look at the time. It is now 1020. I was so busy chatting that I completely forgot to um, look at that. So um, hopefully everyone is back. And um, so now we're going to move into um, a little bit more about uh, limnology and um, dracenid muscles. And then Perry Smith has joined us and we'll hear from him too on some stuff that he's done for um, working with um, working with his youth and his learners um, in a little bit. So I am going to be giving a, a little bit of an overview on limnology here. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully get this to, to work right. I practice every time and then every time I feel like I get a little nervous and still need to talk through it. So here we go. So I believe that you folks are seeing just a PowerPoint right now without my notes or anything. Is that correct? Yes, lovely. Thank you. Okay, Looks thank good. you. Okay, so um, by now, I think most of you folks know who I am. Um, I'm Marty Kitson. I'm an extension educator at uh, Minnesota Sea Grant. And I work with my um, colleagues over in Wisconsin and with Cole, so Ann and Ginny. And um, we work to put these workshops together. So anyway, I'm going to step into a little bit of an educator role myself for a minute and talk about um, zebra, zebra mussels, quagga mussels, and give a very brief uh, limnology overview. So limnology is really just uh, the study of inland waters. Um, it is lakes, reservoirs, rivers, streams, wetlands, groundwater, and it also includes um, both fresh and saline inland waters. And so that may be a little piece that um, comes as some surprise. Oftentimes people talk about limnology being the study of fresh water, but it can also be saline if it is inland. Uh, limnology is a really broad and complex topic. Um, it is nestled within the landscape setting. So in addition to the water itself, it also considers inputs that are coming in off of the land um, in that watershed and also in the, the air shed as well. And it's made up of a couple of different components um, which have a lot of subcomponents under it. So physical components such as light, oxygen, temperature, chemical components such as nutrients. Today we're going to talk a little bit about phosphorus, uh, pH, and alkalinity, and then also biological components. So algae, plankton, fish, bacteria, all of those sorts of things. And all of those pieces are what comprise the, the study of limnology. And one of the major um, sort of concepts within limnology is about temperature stratification in, in lakes. And so I'd like to orient you just a little bit to this, this simple image that I put together of a, my little make-believe lake with my water, uh, surface water up here. But this is just, you know, one half of a, of a XY axis, right? And so we have our origin here and we have zero degrees C here and 25 degrees C here. And then typically you would have, you know, your zero for your Y axis here and it would expand um, outward and, and to, the, to the left. But when we're looking at visualizing data in lakes, we often put the zero up here because that corresponds to the um, surface of the lake. And so if you are dropping an instrument into the lake and taking readings, then your readings um, are collected from zero meters and move on down. And so that's how data is often um, visualized when it comes to, comes to lakes and stratification and other sorts of metrics. And so that little um, piece of information or that little tool that I just dropped into the lake is actually a part of a program that we have. It's called the Limno Loan Program, and it is a hydrolab. Now, hydrolabs 
are um, an instrument that can collect all kinds of different data depending on the sensors that are attached to the device. And so some of the things that that hydro lab can measure are dissolved oxygen, conductivity, pH and turbidity, and then chlorophyll A, which is really just a metric to understand how much algae is in the water. And the way that we're talking about it today, also a way to sort of understand how much phosphorus is in the water um, and then depth and temperature. And so if you've dropped your little device into your lake and say you're measuring temperature, um, when the sun comes out like this, you end up with warm water on your surface. Like say you've got that mid-July, 4th of July, uh, 4th of July sort of weather where the temperature is around 70 or high 70s at the surface. You're swimming at the cabin and that's all wonderful. You jump in and um, you end up with that really cold spot that you hit that almost everyone has experienced probably when swimming in a lake in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Um, that right there is the thermocline. And so this is this rapid place of temperature reduction within your lake. You get the nice warm surface area waters and then it just um, tapers off and then um, pretty soon becomes uh, its coldest, which is um, coldest and, and densest, which is four degrees Celsius. This is one of the interesting properties of water. Most folks probably know this already, but um, from a molecular structure standpoint, water is densest at four degrees Celsius. And so molecules of water that are that temperature sink, um, which is what allows ice to float. And of course, what allows your warmer um, water molecules to be um, higher up in the water. And so this is a pretty typical temperature profile, it's called, of a lake, say, in late summer. But what happens then? Um, oh, so then this has major implications for the biology in the lake. Um, these are my little um, cartoon algaes. And I really hope that Cole Fisher is smiling right now because I used um, her as inspiration for all of my, my artwork on this. Um, so oftentimes when you get a thermocline that is set up in a lake in summer, you get this interesting concentration of algae and it often happens right at this thermocline level and the reasons for this are because um, that is an advantageous place for algae to be sitting in the water um, if they're getting some light they're photosynthetic organisms and so the sunlight's coming down and they're able to photosynthesize and make some food but there's also this sort of thermal refuge here where um, they're metabolic, it's metabolic, metabolically advantageous for them to sort of hang out in this cooler water. And so you end up with this interesting concentration, which is a direct effect of the temperature profile that you see. And so this is one example of a classic uh, limnological interaction between the different components that make up that study. Now, um, this isn't, lakes aren't like this all the time. Um, they do change seasonally and they also change with wind events. And so this is an image that indicates what happens when you get um, water that's um, been mixed. And so mixing can happen. There can be thermal mixing that happens in the season, in the, sh in the shoulder season, so in spring or in fall. And it can also happen with the assistance of wind. And so if wind blows across the surface of your water and the temperature is just right, you end up with a thorough mixing. And so your temperature, all of a sudden, instead of setting up that interesting profile, it just gets into a straight line where temperature is um, fairly consistent throughout the whole lake. If you dove into this lake, you wouldn't feel that, that cold thermocline. You wouldn't pass by that. And then here, this indicates the mixing. And then, of course, this is what happens to the organisms that are living in that lake is since plankton are really weak swimmers, they can regulate their buoyancy a little bit and move up and down, but they can't really swim directionally. Um, they end up being kind of distributed throughout the lake. And so um, enter something like an invasive species such as dracaenid mussels. We've already learned that dracaenids are comprised of these two different species here within um, our Great Lakes region, the zebra and quagga mussels. These organisms end up on the bottom of the lake and they have some pretty major implications for the rest of the, rest of the way that the lake functions and works. And so um, algae, of course, contains phosphorus. And when zebra mussels come in, there are then less nutrients in the water, less algae, 
uh, less chlorophyll A, less nutrients. And there are more of those nutrients in the Dracaenids because as Dr. Elgin indicated, they're filter feeders and they just suck that food in. And so they serve as a nutrient sink and all the nutrients are sitting in the zebra mussel instead of out and available for other organisms to consume. So when this happens, you end up with more zebra mussels as the, um, as the um, water conditions are right and favorable. And so they end up storing all of these nutrients. But after a while, you do end up with the challenge, of course, of ending up with less food in the water column and, or in the water. And it's in some instances, you end up in situations where there is no longer enough food to support that zebra mussel population. And so then the zebra mussels start to um, die off. And when they do that, as you can imagine, the nutrients that they contained are released through the process of decomposition. Um, but these nutrients are now in a different place in the lake. They aren't necessarily hanging out at the thermocline. They aren't you know, distribute, distributed like you saw in the previous slide, they are now um, found more in the, um, near the lake bottom. And so the bacteria that are doing the decomposition of mussels also, um, Dr. Elgin re, um, also talked about this, is that they create an oxygen dead zone because bacteria, of course, use oxygen while they're decomposing. And then you can end up with an area at the bottom of your lake that doesn't have um, any oxygen or has very low oxygen levels. And so all of this is um, interesting and has an impact on our water quality. Uh, not surprisingly, Dracaenid mussels can influence water quality and they're doing so in a really big way. Uh, researcher Dr. Ted Ozerski and a PhD candidate Audrey Huff at the University of Minnesota Duluth's Large Lakes Observatory and also partner, partnering um, with researchers at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, built a model uh, that indicates that water quality is now dictated more by the growth and decline of zebra mussel populations um, rather than from getting nutrients loading in from outside of the lake. And so this has some pretty big um, implications for how things are managed going forward. And I found an interesting um, newsletter article of this. I've got a link right here in this um, publication. So it's a nice, um, very reader friendly uh, piece of information if you want to learn more about how Dracaenids are influencing water quality in that way. And then we also have um, the primary piece of literature that the newsletter was based on. So if you're curious in reading about um, the science and the scientific write-up, you can look at that there. So what does all of this mean? Well, this finding that was discovered suggests that managing water quality in the Great Lakes will become a lot more complex. And the way that water quality is managed today primarily focuses on limiting the amount of phosphorus that enters the water from the land. And so wastewater treatment um, point is a point source um, is a point source and they can have um, total maximum daily loads that limit um, the amount of phosphorus that's allowed. And then agricultural practices uh, of applying fertilizer, which is a non-point source, um, there can be reduction efforts by reducing tillage. So not so much dust ends up in the air that has phosphorus attached to it. And then also um, planting, um, planting cover crops can also be helpful. And so those are um, two ways that things are traditionally managed that are not necessarily going to be as effective if we end up with this internal cycling of nutrients that um, the Dracaenid muscle populations increases and decreases are, are changing. And so with that, I've got a couple of other um, suggestions for you. If you're curious about how to um, maybe teach and talk about nutrients and nutrient loading within a watershed um, going into your lakes, there is a product out there called the Watershed Game. Um, this game, there's, there's actually a couple of versions of it. And one of them is for classroom audiences and one of them is for decision makers. And so if you would like to learn a little bit more about that, 
um, you can feel free to visit um, this website here, watershed game at umn.edu. And I also have um, this link in the notes that are found in the Google Drive. So you don't need to worry about um, copying it down right now. And so that's pretty much what I've got for a very thumbnail sketch of limnology and water quality in Dracenids. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to Anne now to introduce our next speaker. Perry, who has a great tool for you to use that uh, demonstrates these impacts uh, plus more. Yeah, um, I'm thrilled to introduce my um, friend, Perry Smith, who's also one of our awesome um, Sea Grant and um, Seagull teachers. Uh, his bio is in with the biomaterials, but I met uh, Perry a couple of years ago when he was a third, fourth grade teacher at an elementary school and they were doing these learning expeditions where they um, you know for a month or so focus in on Great Lakes learning um, and teach uh, all the different as many different aspects including aquatic invasive species and shipwrecks and so a couple, uh, little while ago when COVID hit we were searching for ways to support teachers and I remember Perry working on this um, you know, on the Great Lakes unit. And I thought it might be kind of fun to see him explore how to bring AIS and shipwrecks together. So um, I'm not gonna talk much on about, much more about it, but just read his bio. He's um, connected to the Great Lakes in many ways and has participated in Seagull programming um, and our shipboard science. So anyway, take it away, Perry. And um, yeah. Well, thank you, Anne, and hello to everybody. I see a lot of familiar names uh, on the Zoom screen here, including my uh, colleague, Susan, who teaches at the same school as I do, and a couple, and Ginny, and let's see, I see Mick, and Olivia, and who else? Brian, of course, and I'm not sure if that's the Kelly I know or not. I'm thinking it might be Kelly Kohler, but it may not be. I don't know. But anyway, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm not going to be with you very long. I'm actually just taking a break from my summer job. I work in a bike shop, so I'm in the back room of the office. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so like Ann mentioned, she'd asked me to kind of work on developing a resource dealing with shipwrecks since uh, Susan and I had been working with shipwrecks with our students in fourth grade as part of our Great Lakes expedition. And as we started talking about it, we kind of decided to that my focus would be on the impact that invasive species have on Great Lakes shipwrecks. And it was, it's, it was pretty timely because, I mean, there's a lot of kind of older stuff that I was able to find older resources, but then within the last year, there's really been kind of a little mini explosion of outside resources that I was able to uh, kind of tap into. And I ended up um, making a, what's called a story map. And I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh oh, why isn't it letting me do that? Let me try this again. Um, so a story map, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a tool <clears throat> that helps you, that um, is a way to kind of really incorporate geography and into just really any kind of curriculum focus you wanna have that has a geographical component. And the title of my story map is Lake Michigan Shipwrecks and Aquatic Invasive Species. And I'm just gonna kind of scroll through it and give you just a brief overview of the different um, parts of my story map and sort of how I developed it. Um, you know, I started with just a basic vocabulary list and this map on the right was one that just one of the many map resources that is available through the story map website itself. And then I um, did a worksheet and then just an int introduction about, you know, where zebra and quagga mussels came from, um, how they got here. And then I included a video that's was produced in 2011, but it's still, you know, very relevant today. And it's part of this whole silent invaders, which is a series about invasive species, I think was originally on the discovery channel or something like that, but just very, um, a lot of really dramatic music. And we've used this video for years with our students to introduce zebras and quaggas, but also sea lampreys and, uh, 
you know, any number of other different aquatic invasive species. They have a different um, episodes devoted to different invasive species. So that is a good resource. Then I'm just going to keep scrolling down and talking about a little bit more how they got here, you know, through the St. Lawrence Seaway and, and the Welland Canal in particular, once that was built that kind of opened it, the Great Lakes up to ocean going ships and what was in their ballast water and talks about what ballast water is. And then this next video <clears throat> was done by the University of Michigan and it there's some great footage of some bottom trawls and just a number of zebras and quaggas that they're able to come, you know, pull up and this is back in 2009. So again, not super timely, but still relevant to us and our work and then get into how the zebras and quaggas really filter the water, you know, and anecdotally, this is something that I've known since uh, living on the shores of Lake Michigan as a child and then as an adult just watching how the, the water clarity changing you know when I was a kid I, I knew the impact of invasives just because of the piles of alewives that would wash up on the beach but then as I grew older and was you know able to observe a little bit more just the, how the clarity of the water changed and this picture on the right that I included was actually done as a pre-service in-service at the UW Milwaukee and this is an experiment that was set up, but I can't remember the professor's name, but he's featured in a couple of the videos on here. Um, but it's just pretty amazing that within 10 minutes of time, how just a, you know, a handful of muscles could really filter the water and clarify the, clarify the water. And then I included a really cool sea grant that just shows sped up quagga mussels feeding. So that was pretty cool to watch. And then I get into the kind of the impact that zebras and quaggas are having on Great Lakes shipwrecks. And one impact that they're having is kind of how it impacts more of how divers and people can interact now with shipwrecks because of the increased water clarity. So that may be almost considered a positive, right? But then <clears throat> get, in and get it into more of it, just the degradation that's starting to happen on the wood and, and you know, the metal and the things like that. So there's a good blog post from, I think that was a C Grant blog post that I, that I uh, included. And then this next video is really cool. Um, a gentleman from Northland College that has been doing some work up in Lake Superior involving um, zebras and quaggas kind of approached Ann and I about this and shared this video with us. So I put that on there as well. Um, and then I get into some specifics. So using uh, Wisconsin Sea Grants Shipwrecks website is able to kind of focus on two different wrecks. One is the Lakeland, and that's a picture of her on the right. And I think, no, nope, I don't have the map of that. Okay. But anyway, there's two different videos of two, two different dives, one in 2007 and one in 2018. And they really show just the increase in the quagga growth on the Lakeland. And then scrolling down, the Rose Simmons. The Rose Simmons is a very famous shipwreck. And so those are my friends that are into rivers. Hi, Brian. Um, the Rose Simmons is known as a Christmas tree ship. And she went down off Raleigh Point in 1912 with a cargo of Christmas trees that were bound for Chicago. And I was able to find some footage of a dive again in 2007 and then a dive in 2014 to really show the increase in muscles, muscle growth on that shipwreck. And I have to say this tree in this photo right here, I think that was actually plant that was actually stuck there. I don't think that's actually from the wreck. I think the trees have actually all, you know, decomposed and decayed. So there's not actually a tree sitting on the bow of the Christmas tree ship underwater. Um, and then you can see on the map the location. And that was this map I pulled from that shipwrecks website that I referenced earlier. And hopefully Anne can share that link with you and hopefully she can share the link to this story map as well. And then I just have some other, um, included some other resources that you can check out. The Most Wanted AIS is a really good, really kid-friendly website that we use with our students all the time. Um, Alien Invaders, the Wisconsin DNR site, that's another excellent resource, really, again, kid-friendly. And then the Wisconsin Sea Grant, 
also has just a ton of really great resources. And then kind of Great Lakes Shipwrecks, the Shipwreck Museum, I think that's up in Whitefish Point. And 1913, it's really interesting just the amount of wrecks that happened in that year. And then this is information about the National Marine Sanctuary, National Marine Sanctuary, excuse me, Sanctuary, which was in the works for a long time and just this summer was finally um, established off the coast of Manitowoc and Two Rivers and that sort of thing in that place. So that's pretty cool. And then there's a link to a Quizlet. If you guys are familiar with that website, Quizlet is a fun vocabulary website that you can make your own word lists and the kids love it and they can play against each other. It's just really fun. And then of course, the Great Lakes Literary, Liter Literacy Principles and Wisconsin Academic Standards at this, those two. So I really would encourage you guys to check out Story Maps. You can um, get an account for free and make your own um, story maps like this. It's just a great way. The kids love it. They, it's very engaging for them. Um, yeah, so I guess any questions that anybody has, either about the story map specifically or story maps in general or about any of the information that I shared here. Yeah. Hey, Perry. So I used story maps um, with the Girl Scout camp last week and I what they have zero internet connection there. So I printed some out. If you have an account, is there a better way to export that to a PDF and make it easier to read? It, it did not print nice for me. That is a good question. I don't have an answer to that question. I've never tried it. So I don't have experience with that. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Any other questions um, about the presentations in this section? Um, and if not, I know we're a little bit behind schedule, so we should probably um, pop to break soon. Um, if I can just interject, um, I would encourage you guys to check this out on the Sea Grant website and also check out Susan Dury's um, Shipwreck Scavenger Hunt. That's another great resource that she developed. That's really cool. So give her a little plug here too. So. Perry, what was the name of that um, person for with the scavenger hunt? Uh, Susan Juries. Okay. She's actually she's actually in this presentation right now. So. Okay. And and, and that was one of the activities that we featured last week when we were looking at the um, shipwrecks as part of our first workshop. So, if you're looking for a link uh, to that exercise, it's part of the pre-workshop um, materials from last week. Oh, and I have to thank Anne and whoever her editor is because they really helped a lot with, with the story map and added some really great info as well, so. All right. Well, thanks, Perry. We really appreciate you taking time out of your work day to come and yeah. um, give us a little orientation on this. And I did drop um, the direct link to your story map in the chat. So hopefully people have access to that and some of the other resources. Um, but it is 1048 and our joyful hour was to begin at 1045 so we're a couple of minutes um, behind schedule but just one thing before I let you go for a, you know like a two minute break to take care of any needs you may have and that is if you are unable to join us for the joyful hour. Um, this is my time to encourage you to please, please uh, fill out the post event evaluation form. If you're planning on being part of the joyful hour, you can wait uh, until after and until after that to do that. But it is part of our um, Great Lakes restoration funding requirement. And so we really rely on those responses to help continue bringing good programming to you. So um, Cole, if you have that link available, if you could drop it in the chat for those who may not be able to um, participate in joyful hour that would be great and otherwise um, we'll see you back here mine says 1048 so we'll see you here at you know 10 what 1050 1051 and we'll uh, roll along so thanks everyone and thanks again Perry really appreciate having you come and thank you Susan uh, for that resource as well So Brian, you're going to use story, or is it you who was going to use it? The yeah. story maps? Tell me about what you're going to do. 
I've created a story map for the BWET um, program mm -hmm. that we were involved with and as, as a whole school, fifth through, through eighth grade. And um, we used it for a presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm going to be using it in, not think, I will be using it in my um, Great Lakes um, unit on ecosystems in the Great Lakes. Cool. And, and we also have a unit on matter and energy cycling mm -hmm. through systems. And I'm going to focus that system on Lake Michigan. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So we're going to actually um, be doing two units this year. Last year, I just focused more on um, Great Lakes ecosystems mm -hmm. and uh, invasive species was a big part of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Do the kids um, handle the story maps or is it just for the teachers to create and use? Um, no, I think I, I will expand, well, I will model it. And mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna expand that into the students actually being the creators of the story maps, um, more focused on what they're doing mm -hmm. as far as you know, uh, unit activities and things like that. So. Um, as part of the NGSS standards, mm -hmm. um, students need to show um, that they can create arguments or create mm -hmm. models and things like that. And I think uh, story maps would be a great way to mm -hmm. utilize that model modeling aspect yeah. uh, to meet the standards. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. I was just curious if that age group was up for the technology ch challenge, and it sounds like they they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. At the seventh grade level, yes. Um, and I, all the way through uh, yeah. middle school, fifth, fifth through eighth grade, those kids are, are just tech savvy and they're, they're yeah. willing to take on anything new. And, yeah. and I think it'll open um, more doors for them, so to speak, mm -hmm. and create more excitement in learning about the Great Lakes. Yeah. Do you, um, so if, it, if you were to work with a student, you know, when I did my story, when I worked with Perry and when I've done it before, I always do like a storyboard. I kind of lay out what I want to accomplish. Is that a step you take with these seventh graders if they're going to create a story map? Yeah, we, we would probably use more concept mapping mm -hmm. um, yeah. methods to create a, some type of framework for mm -hmm. them, you know, a plan. Yeah. Um, to laying out their story maps and the story map program is so diverse. I mean, yeah. there's so much you can do with it and inserting videos and, mm -hmm. and other links and things like that, you know, like, like uh, Perry talked about um, the Quizlets mm -hmm. and, you know, all those things, Jamboard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's so many resources that they can use. Yeah. That's cool. I was just wondering, cause I find like, it that's a seems like a hard skill for a kid to take take on you know they just kind of want to throw things in but having them under but it sounds like a concept board is the same idea I was thinking about with a storyboard where you kind of lay it all out and make connections and sure see, see where the story goes the the mm -hmm. narrative that's interesting well, ask you, oh, go, ahead. go ahead no no go ahead I had a different um, question you know it's it's such a different um, avenue for them to take versus uh, creating a research report mm -hmm. or PowerPoints and mm -hmm. things like that. And kids, kids are so, um, oh, what am I trying to say? They're, they're so used to doing things the old way that I think when mm -hmm. you open new avenues for them to explore, they they really will take to it, especially if you model it and show them, mm -hmm. look what this thing can do. Yeah. And then, you know, you capture their attention, like, oh my God, how did they do that? You know, yeah. how'd you do that? That's cool. So no, I think for digital natives, I think story maps are just really awesome and a great way to do place-based approaches. Mm -hmm. So I want I'll hear I, I might try to touch base with you on this during the school year to hear how it goes. Oh, absolutely. Cool. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose we should probably um, shift over to our joyful hour topic. And so I'm officially switching MC duties with Cole. So Cole, you can go ahead and hop in and take the lead. Thanks, Marty. So um, now we were going to transition to our joyful hour time. And uh, most of you, I think, have been with us before. So you kind of know what to expect. But 
Before we jump into breakout rooms, um, we did want to talk about our topic today, which is water quality stewardship. And so we had asked you to do um, some little pre-workshop exercise so that we would um, be able to talk about this. One of the exercises we asked you to do was um, to potentially build a water clarity testing device. And so just a little background on this, um, Minnesota Sea Grant has received some funding to make videos so that we can provide students with directions on how to do this themselves and then have these low cost uh, devices to potentially use in water clarity stewardship activities. So that's where we were coming from with this. And so um, we were kind of hoping that we could get those of you who built these devices to show us your finished products. And um, Marty was gonna try to grab some screenshots so we could maybe use those for some promotional um, opportunities. Um, can I just see a, a show of hands? Because when we did the survey earlier, we did have some people who have not been able to join us. If you are unfamiliar with what a sucky disc is, can you raise your hand? I don't want to, you know, like make everybody listen to an explanation if everybody here is all on the same page. So if you'd like an explanation of what a sucky disc is, can you raise your hand? So I'm going to assume that everybody knows what this is. So if you've built your Seki disc, can you show it to us? Can you hold it up to your um, camera? And uh, I will hold up my test one. Oh, you know what, Marty? Let me turn off my background here. It'll show better. And maybe the screen share too, so I can get a full gallery view of everybody. Oh, look at that. We've got some coming. All right, cool. Well, look at that nice work you guys did. Okay, I think I've got it. Let me just take a look here and drop it into my my uh, awaiting document. Oh, there we go. I have got a slick label on his bottle too. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. The great, oh, I kind of want to do, I don't know if I got, did I get that in there? Oh, I think I did. Okay, good. I, I, I just got Pepsi. <laughs> yeah, you just got Pepsi. Okay. So are you good there, Marty? Yeah. What other devices do we have today? So it, I'm not sure if anyone here built one, but the other one was our turbidity tube. And so who's who's familiar with what a turbidity tube is? Can you raise your hand? I think there's probably more people who don't know than who do. So there's there's a few people who do know what it is. Okay. So a turbidity tube is used in a similar function to measure water clarity, um, but it's for a shallow body of water or like a stream. And so like you're, you're measuring how much material is suspended in that shallow body of water. You don't have the room to dip the Secchi disc, right? So you would fill up this tube. And uh, so in our directions, we use uh, approximately a 48 inch or one meter tube somewhere. Um, and then you need a way to actually test. And there's different ways turbidity tubes work. Um, so a very simple model that we built was to put an itty bitty little secchi disc on the end of this stick. And then we just kind of marked the stick with um, centimeters and then you put it in your tube and just like with a sucky disc then when you can no longer see the disc at the end of your stick that's how you would take your measurement so very similar concept but because this way we're just taking and filling the tube with water out of our shallow um, body of water we don't have to worry about having the depth to drop an actual sucky disc right so does everybody follow so did anyone build one of these today? Am I the only one who has one? Do you want to you want to take a picture of mine, Marty? Or I of course I do, Cole. <laughs> I want a picture of your of your turbidity tube. So there, I've got. I think I've got it. Okay. <laughs> so um, I did make a short little um, 
survey that we'll go through. And even if you didn't build a device, we would still like you to answer some of the questions about how you might see this being usable with different aged learners. Um, if you can just go ahead and if you still have the tab open from earlier this morning, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll uh, drop that code back into the chat and navigate to that survey. Thanks, Ginny. And so our first question is just asking which one you built. And so some of you have not actually built one. That's okay. Just mark that you did a different opportunity. I'll put this up here on the screen so that we can all see everyone's answers. Come on, where's my Zoom? Oh, there's my Zoom. All right. So this is just going to record for me so that later for our data, we'll be able to know um, how many people did which exercise. And then our next question is, can you please tell us um, why you chose to do the activity that you did? So if you chose to do the the disc versus the tube, and if you chose not to do one, um, we'd kind of like to know why you chose not to do one too. That would be helpful. Okay, somebody's already used them. They've got one in hand. <laughs> Okay, so somebody wanted to use it from their canoe. And yeah, I'm thinking probably if you are um, fortunate to be located near a stream or a shallower pond where students can't maybe get out on a dock or on a boat, the turbidity tube would probably work really good in those situations. If someone wants to compare. Um, Using it from the pontoon, excellent. Okay. Um, is everybody about caught up? I'm gonna move on to our next question. And so we'd just like to know whether you think the cost of the supplies or the ability to get the supplies would be a barrier for um, use with students. I'm just gonna give a few more seconds. This is hopefully a pretty quick one. Okay, and then our next question is, if you would give us any thoughts you have on what barriers you could foresee with building these devices with students um, outside of cost, because we just kind of addressed that one. getting the students to the water, sure. Okay, lo location, yeah, okay. So it takes time to build one. So not that I'm disagreeing, but whoever made that comment, is it something that 
you um you actually like have built one and you felt that it was time consuming or do you just suspect it would be hard to manage students and get the students to do it partially assemble okay good thoughts okay great thank you so i think I'm going to shuffle to the next question. I think the next question is going to ask what you thought of the directions. So if you didn't build this device, you might not be able to answer this question. Um, but if you could just give us feedback, if you looked at the instructions on whether or not you think that they were clear and useful. Okay, so having an actual example to look at made it seem less confusing. <laughs> That's good feedback. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Um, I have a question coming up here where I'm interested in knowing what age groups that you think would be suitable for this type of activity. Ah, thank you for your comment, Ashley. Ashley says that um, the benefit of a turbidity tube is that it can be tested in the classroom using water with low and high phytoplankton and or sediments that are prepared in aquarium in labs. I'm wondering too, Ashley, could they actually, like a teacher maybe go out to a body of water and collect the sample and then just like hold on to that until class and then use that. Yeah, I think that that would be a possibility too. It also could be for, uh, fun for the students to see a growing phytoplankton in a tank, you know, a green tank that's fertilized versus a clear tank that's not being fertilized. And they could okay. see kind of the, the green water, clear water, and then putting it in the tube, get different readings from it. And they could get readings from it over a few days because the green tank with the good conditions will keep getting greener and they could get measurements over time and see how that that changes using the turbidity too. Excellent. Yeah, just thinking creatively because I, I know it is hard to get students to water sometimes. That was super helpful. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so has everyone had a chance to answer the question about the grades that you think this would be appropriate for? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and shuffle on to the next question. I think there's only one left, so we're almost done and I appreciate your patience. So here we just like to know if you have any immediate ideas about how you think building a water clarity device could be incorporated into your lessons or curriculum. Oh, we've got a little, I must have set this one up differently. We've got a little cloud of <laughs> answers here. Okay, excellent. Okay, fabulous.
Okay. Well, hopefully that's given everyone a chance to make a response. I think this is our last question, but I'm just gonna hop forward to make sure I didn't forget anything. Yep, that was our last question. All right, so thank you for um, going through this exercise with us. I think it'll be super important. Um, we'll make sure to um, let you folks know when the videos are ready. It'll be our, our fall winter project to put this together and hopefully it will be useful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump out of here. And then that is all I have for the pre breakout um, exercise. So we're going to shuffle you off now to breakout rooms to have your regular discussion. And there'll be an opportunity to talk about those uh, stewardship opportunities that the rest of you um, had investigated. So thanks again. I really appreciate it. Okay, ready? Have fun. It's so hilarious when they just go. It's like, <laughs> okay, so hopefully Susan and Mick. They may have stepped out. I think I can give them a nudge, can't I? Let's see. I think I haven't pushed you over to. Um, now, what I could try to do now so I could go into a breakout is to make you the host. Uh, so Susan is supposed to go in room one and okay. Mick in room two. I'm just so worried that they're gonna get messed up, but <laughs> they'll all come flying back, but I don't see why. Um, okay, cross your fingers, nothing happens. <laughs> Okay. Which room are you going to? It says that you're unassigned. Do you need yeah, to if Ginny, well, the one with Ginny, I think it's room one. Marty and Ashley are in the other one. I just you made two. Go to room one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. That worked. Yay. <laughs>Hey, Mike, are you still here or is this a uh, computer glitch? Hi, Mick. Did you did you get sent to your room? Oh, wait, you're on mute. I can't hear you. <laughs> it's I tried to and then it said I got timed out or something and it kicked me out of the whole meeting. So, okay. So. Um, let me assign you again and we'll give this another whirl. Okay.
Hello. Hello. So that seemed like it went by really fast on my end. I don't know how it was for you guys. <laughs> yeah, it went pretty quick. <laughs> so um, I had down that we were going to wrap up our breakouts at 1120. So um, we would like to have saved some time for a share out between the two groups. So I don't know if you had time to elect a um, share out representative, um, but could we hear from group one first? That's the uh, group that uh, Jenny and Anne were moderating. Oh, we didn't have a chance to uh, pick someone. So I will just real quickly share. Um, we had some really good ideas of activities. Um, we have a wide range of teachers doing working with wide range of audiences. So um, Brian was talking about working with leaf packs, which are exactly what it sounds like. Um, leaves in a mesh netting, putting them out into streams and collecting macro invertebrates and looking at the variety there. Also potentially bringing tanks into the classrooms um, so that they could uh, compare some of the different water bodies and doing some um, possibly doing some plankton sampling if they're able to get the students out um, due to COVID regulations. And Kathy has switched schools and was feeling a little disappointed about potentially not being able to do some of the activities that she was formerly able to do at her previous school since she'll now be in an urban environment and doesn't have ready access to water. And we kind of reminded her that, you know, Something is better than nothing and uh, that, you know, not to necessarily set your standards so high that the kids may not be as disappointed as you are. And then Brian got kind of cut off, but what he was able to share was uh, he works at a school that does have three ponds, all of which have docks available. So he anticipates uh, working on curriculum that focuses on the standards of water moving through systems and interpreting charts, um, specifically maybe looking at water quality measurements related to the hydrosphere and biosphere, and with the young students just doing some fun activities to get them excited about um, the uh, observable world. Great. Be quick, so we'll hopefully you leave managed. sufficient time for the others. Well, you managed to get through a lot in a very short breakout session, so. <laughs> um, group two. We also um, just chatted and I took a couple notes. But I didn't um, assign anybody to share out so I can do that as well. Um, yeah, we also covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Um, we had some really um, industrious people in our group. Um, what Eric spent his 
time doing was he actually went to three different lakes after he built his uh, sake disc to um, test it and measure water quality. He also um, supplemented that sake disc with uh, test strips that he purchased um, off of Amazon, which measured a lot of different parameters. He rattled them all off and I, <laughs> I don't remember them now, but there were about 10 of them. Um, all three lakes were fairly similar. And one th thing of note was that the water was hard in all three lakes, but um, he said that maybe that wasn't too surprising because the water that he has at his home is also hard. Uh, the, the water clarity was about the same in all three lakes, it was about 0.8 meters. Um, he did identify that there are some challenges with putting a static piece of equipment uh, into a lake when it's windy because the piece of equipment might be static, but you're moving. And so that poses some challenges and probably some special considerations for a uh, classroom. Um, Leanne also got out on the water. Um, she um, went to Lake Winnebago and tried her sucky disc in a couple of different places. She also visited the Wisconsin DNR website and found that there was a ton, a ton of data, like to the point where it was overwhelming um, on the website. She also identified that um, wind does indeed um, play a factor in collecting uh, lake data. And then Mick um, also had a ton of hustle. He combined his, um, he combined his, his work with, with some play up in the Boundary Waters. Um, he wasn't particularly intrigued by the idea of using a turbidity tube and using um, algae, grow, algae growth studies uh, in his classroom and then taking a look at the differences, measuring it with a turbidity tube. Um, as far as using um, other equipment, he was um, out in the boundary waters. And while he did not have a secchi disc, he thought, you know, there are times when you just don't have a secchi disc. So what can you do? And one of the things you can do is use yourself as a measuring stick. And so uh, just making observations of like, how much of yourself can I see in that lake? Um, can I see all of me? Can I see twice as much as me? Um, do my, you know, legs disappear below my knees? Just sort of as a really rough estimate of what a water clarity might, might be like in the lakes that you are in or on. Um, he also collected a couple of um, dragonfly exuvia, which were, uh, had zebra mussels attached to them. And he showed us there a quick show and tell and I encouraged him to send us pictures because maybe that could be a cool um, you know, teaching tool for other folks. And um, of the lakes that he was on, he thought that Knife Lake near the, bound, near the border was probably the deepest and clearest. He thought he could probably see about 10 feet down compared to some of the other lakes, um, which are maybe a little more tannin stained. And so that's about all I've got for um, what we covered in our talk. If anyone else has a thing I missed or a key piece, please feel free to feel free to mention um, it. Leanne dropped a question in the chat, and I'm not sure I can answer this, so um, I just want to put it out there. She's wondering how you could explain the different colors of Lake Michigan on a calm day. Does anybody have any thoughts on that for her? All right. Well, I guess we'll have to do some research. <laughs> well, I think I, I think Ashley took herself off mute. Yeah. I, oh, I sorry. Say, yeah, but it could be you know there are areas, and I don't know if it's if you're looking just looking out or if you're looking at some satellite images and you have different colors, but in areas where you have a river coming in, you're definitely going to be getting some sediment coming in, and that can create some different color plumes. Um, otherwise, it could just be there are blooms that come up. That doesn't mean they're harmful algal blooms, but there are, are blooms that come up periodically. And then with depth, you're going to get differences. So if you have areas with, with changing depth, that could influence as well. Yeah. So it depends is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, well, I think we're ready to wrap up our final thoughts. Yep. I think so too. Um, so did I see this is highlighted here. So we did have a couple of just brief announcements for you. Um, this won't take too long and we can drop the information in the chat as well. There it goes, someone dropped it in. So um, there's information that we have on a couple of different uh, websites that we've put up primarily for uh, this, this group's consumption, although because they are 
on the web. They're accessible to anybody. Uh, we've got one on stewardship and one on our mentor program. Also a link to our Students Ask Scientists program, which is a really cool program, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a way to connect students to scientists in the classroom. Um, Ashley, I'll be talking to you a little bit about that if I haven't um, already. And then uh, we've got a Lake Guardian website up and um, a couple of resources available for you, including the Attack Pack, which is a, um, a resource developed by Wisconsin Sea Grant um, for the Center for Great Lakes Literacy. And it has all things aquatic invasive species related in it. And then there are some other resources that you can also find on the Trimming Our Sales website. Um, Oops, I would like to encourage, oh, did I hear something? I lost my slide, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I would like to encourage you all again once more to um, please take a moment to fill out that post event evaluation form. Um, for those of you who stuck through Joyful Hour, we'd, we'd love to hear your feedback all, as always. Um, you guys help design, I mean, literally help design and craft these workshops. And so the feedback that you receive or that we receive from you is, is important, um, both in the uh, Google form way and also just through direct communications with your your state leads and so um i guess it's not goodbye forever good but, but good, goodbye for now and you know thanks so much for being a part of this and i'll open up the floor for any last minute um conversation from any of the other uh of my colleagues and that helped plan the workshop Well, hearing nothing, I think we're all good. So thank you so much um, and have a great rest of your summer. Uh, it's quickly waning. So we'll be in touch. Thank you guys. It was great to see you all again. Uh, bye everyone, thank you. Thank you. Well, there we are. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! <laughs> I just stayed on to say a final goodbye to all of you. That went very smooth. I'm amazed by like keeping on the time and getting everything in. It's really nicely run. Oh, well, mm -hmm. thank you. And thank you so much for being a part of it. Um, it was great. The, I think teachers really enjoyed your, your presentation and your content. And I think it's really exciting when teachers hear that researchers, um, really considered teaching like that there was that 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 bifurcation mm -hmm. or that call kind of to do both I think that's so very cool. much so I was convinced that was my path for a while but and I didn't get into this but my challenge was I was ready to teach the content but I wasn't ready to lead a classroom and be a disciplinarian and I was even told by my student teacher mentor you look younger than some of the students you're teaching and when I was that age, I did, she's like, and, and she was a little mean about it, to be honest. And it was a very discouraging. And I thought, well, I don't have enough life experience to, to be a mentor and to lead a classroom. And that discouraged me from being a high school teacher. Oh, and, how interesting. Another you know, formative and pivotal time. Yeah, that was not positive. So I didn't dwell on that. But um, right. yeah, it, it, that, as far as in life decisions, I went, I'm going this way then instead of, yeah seeking out that teaching. And I thought, well, I need to build up myself and then I'll feel like I'm ready to be that figure to students. And in the process of doing that, I got in a different river and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. So well, ultimately it seems like a good fit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's a, in a good place. And, that, and that's why I was glad when, when Marty reached out to me about doing stuff like this, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I still get to be connected with teachers and help. Yeah. Well, great. And thank you so much. El Ash I was trying, I was trying to combine Ashley and Elgin. <laughs> it didn't work. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Minnesota. How much longer are you here? We'll, we'll leave tomorrow morning. So I have the rest of today. We're going to go do some stuff around the farm. My husband and his dad are re-roofing a barn and then we might 